తెలుగు ప్రజల మనసాక్షి సాక్షి టీవీ ఐ ఎమ్ స్వర్ణ వెల్కమ్ టు సాక్షి టీవీ స్పెషల్ ఇమిగ్రేషన్ షో విత్ అటార్నీ ప్రశాంతి రెడ్డి ఫ్రమ్ లా ఆఫీస్ ఆఫ్ ప్రశాంతి రెడ్డి పిఎల్ఎల్సి ప్లీజ్ నోట్ దట్ సాక్షి టీవీ నౌ హ్యాస్ త్రీ ఇమిగ్రేషన్ షోస్ ఎవ్రీ వీక్ ఆన్ ట్యూస్డే ఎట్ త్రీ పిఎం ఈఎస్టి విత్ అటార్నీ మిస్ షీలా మూర్తి వెడ్నెస్డే ఎట్ ఫైవ్ థర్టీ పిఎం ఈఎస్టి విత్ అటార్నీ మిస్ ప్రశాంతి రెడ్డి అండ్ ఆన్ ఫ్రైడే ఎట్ సిక్స్ పిఎం ఈఎస్టి విత్ భాను ఇలింగి ప్లీజ్ చూన్ ఇన్ టు ఆస్క్ యువర్ క్వశ్చన్స్ If you have any queries regarding immigration, please feel free to call us. Our attorneys would like to answer your questions. If you are an immigration attorney and would like to join us in our special shows, please email us at usa at sakshi.com or you can call us at 866-725-7441. Before we begin the show, please note down the information provided in this show is not a legal advice. It's for general information purposes only. Sakshi TV or its agents are not responsible for the use of this information. If you need a specific legal advice, please contact attorney directly. Today, we are going to talk about updates on September visa bulletin and H-1B frequently asked questions. For that, we have attorney Prashanti Reddy with us. Without any further delay, let's start our show by welcoming Ms. Prashanti Reddy. Hello, Ms. Reddy. How are you? Welcome to the show. I am good. How are you, Swarna? I'm good. Thank you. Can you please provide information on your law offices, practice areas and your experiences, please? Um, yes. Uh, as I say every week, uh, my the name of my firm is Law Offices of Prashanti Vedi. I have 20 plus years of experience. I do immigration, business, family. Um, and if you need to reach me, you can go to my website, vediesq.com. So viewers, if you have any questions and would like to reach out Ms. Reddy directly, you can call her at 212-354-1010, extension is 107, or you can email her at prashanti at reddysq.com. So Ms. Reddy, these are some of the frequently asked questions. So I'm, I'm currently on ninth year extension of H1B. Is there any possibility to shift a different company? If yes, what is the procedure? So... Um to this uh, today's topic, we're going to cover frequently asked questions on H-1B, and we're also going to look into what the visa bulletin um, is for this uh, month. So let's start off with the um, visa bulletin, Swarna. Um, so um, the visa bulletin for September just came out, so that's is, it is a hot topic, so we should start with that. Uh, and um, the... This month, they're going to be using final action dates, as they usually do for the visa bulletin. So they're not going to be using dates for filing. And as per the final action date, uh, again, there's a rapid movement for India in EB3. So EB3 has moved to January 1, 2014. And that's a movement of uh, six months, uh, from July 2013 to uh, you know January 2014. And uh, also EB2 has also moved. It's moved by three months from uh, September 2011 to June 2011. Um, I mean, sorry, it was earlier June 2011 and it's moved now to September 2011. So that's EB2 moved by three months and EB3, uh, as we know, um, there's been continuous movement before is moving rapidly and it's moved again by six months. So now we have to wait and see um, what happens with the September visa bulletin. Um, so we know what happens with the September visa bulletin. We have to wait and see what happens in September for the October visa bulletin. Uh, and that's a big uh, uh, something that is going to be highly anticipated. Uh, because in October, that's when the new fiscal year starts. And usually they move it to dates for filing. So the dates for filing should be um, the uh, dates that we use for that visa bulletin. And uh, let's hope that, uh, you know, in, in um, September we get news about October that dates for filing will be used, and we're hoping that uh, you know, EB3 will progress even further for dates of filing. And, you know, uh, we're able to uh, file a lot more cases. So, uh, folks, watch out for 
next month's update on the visa bulletin uh, and my suggestion to all of you um, viewers who are you know who are waiting to file a 485 is to keep all your documents ready um, for um, because in September then you may not be able to get your birth certificate you may not be able to obtain non-availability certificates so medicals you can only do 30 days before filing so hold off on your medicals but all other documents um, if there's any um, questions that you have on what documents are needed uh, you can reach out to me uh, you know to my email or call my extension directly and I can help you with getting your documents to ready getting your documents ready at least so that's something to keep in mind um, you know, Char Charlie Oppenheim, who's a yes, sorry, we have a caller, Mr. Praveen from sure. Virginia. Hello, hello, Mr. Praveen. Hello, yeah, hi. Uh, I have a question regarding the <coughs> um, uh, filing. Uh, last October, my priority date is uh, 2011, June 15th. I went for the downgrading in uh, October. And uh, I didn't get any uh, EAD or advanced payroll or biometric as of now. And I went for the I-140 premium process for three times, 30, 30 days uh, mm -hmm. uh, the period. But even they rejected uh, on the EB3. So my question is, what are the pros and cons if I go for the interfiling? Because my uh, priority date become a current in EB2. Uh, and or can I submit a new uh, 485 application in a uh, EB2 category? Is there any option for the interfiling? Will it take a more time if I go for the interfiling uh, under EB2 or uh, using the current uh, I-140 and or can I submit a new 485 application under EB2? Um, yeah, so... Basically, what you're saying is you filed under EB3. You did an EB3 downgrade, right, in October and filed the I-140 and 485 yeah. concurrently. Yeah. And now you're trying to do premium processing and you're not able to do it. Uh, I, I did. So, I went for um, the times, but it was rejected. Right, I know. Premium and we've had um, yeah. issues with some cases also where we have filed two times, three times, and each time it gets rejected. And some cases get accepted. So it seems to be, um, you know, that USCIS is not treating all cases equally. It depends really on where uh, they have housed the uh, um, original labor. Sometimes they send it for storage and they're not able to retrieve it uh, quickly enough to do premium processing. So they keep sending the okay. case back when you send it for premium processing. Sometimes they have it on hand, they have it in their office. And they're able to very easily do premium processing. So it really um, doesn't seem to be following any order. It's just your luck whether your file is um, easily available to them or it's not. They have to retrieve it from some storage location. So that's what it seems to be when they're, with reference to success of I-140 premium processing uh, downgrade. Uh, so now your question is that... Uh, you're hoping that your e your EB2 is already current as of the September visa bulletin? Yeah. Yeah, my priority date is current in a September visa bulletin mm. and the EB2. So my question is, can I do the interfiling yeah. or can I go for the new 485 application under EB2 or uh, can I stick with the EB2? Because 485 so you can and definitely, um, the Right. Maybe. So obviously, they are, uh, 485, present 485 is stuck because... The I-140 is not approved yet and you cannot convert to premium processing. But if your EB-2 is current based on dates for filing, they should automatically be taking... Is it the same employer that did the both EB-2 and EB-3? Yeah, same employer. Okay. So then uh, if it's the same employer, you can do either. You can do interfiling or you can file a new application. You can do both. Since the so, um, yeah, go ahead. Interfiling means uh, will it take a much time uh, at this moment? Or that is the thing we don't know. Clear? We don't know. Yeah, we don't know how long it will take. Nobody knows, and there is no okay. uh, process for doing it. You have to open a service request, and and you have to okay. uh, ask to speak to an officer, and you have to give them your 
140 EB2, um, you know, uh, receipt and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, um, upload that on your service request that you have an I-140 approval for EB2 and you wish to interfile. Uh, okay. That's definitely one way of doing it. You can also refile your 485. No one is, no one can stop you from refiling. They will only approve one 485. Obviously, they will process okay. the 485 with the current date first. Okay. Uh, so which would be your EB2 485. So if you don't mind spending the money, um, you know, I would try to, I mean, because it's a window of opportunity that you don't want to lose because you don't yeah. know when, um, until when it will be current. It might be current until next year also because they said Charlie Oppenheim, you know, the person who uh, publishes the visa bulletin every month, he did say he's not expecting the dates to retrogress until next year uh, yeah. until things get back to normal at the consulate. But the only problem with interfiling is the uncertainty. So there's no okay. harm in doing that interfiling now, trying now and seeing if you get any progress on the interfiling. And if you don't see any okay. progress, then uh, no harm in uh, then attempting to um, file another 485 application. Okay. Okay, I'll do so. Uh, we can do that one. Okay. So another 485 Definitely, application yeah. is entire again. Again, I need to pay the USCIS. Yes, the disadvantage the of that, oh. the disadvantage of that is again you have to go through the processing time, which is twelve to eight okay. months. You know, again okay. you have to pay okay. the money for the medicals most probably. Uh, biometrics, okay. if it's already done, they may not ask you to do it again, but you have to pay the entire fee again. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Okay. So, so definitely, if the interfiling. Works. It's definitely uh, you know the best option. It's only thing is that you might be a little anxious because you might not hear anything. Uh, they'll yeah. say thirty to sixty Michael, days. So there's no harm in trying. Try the interfiling first. My my concern is if I go for the interfiling, if the dates go back so again, means So maybe that I is mean, the risk. That is the risk, risk you're taking. You yes. Yeah. Okay. 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 Correct. That's a risk you're taking. Nobody knows for sure what the priority dates will be for uh, October. Uh, but we're not really expecting the final action date to go back. But there's no guarantee, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what uh, I may not consider in EB2 or EB3 until it will be fulfilled by that, you know, end of Friday. So that is the only concern. Right. right? Okay. 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 Thank yeah. you, ma'am. Thanks for your advice. You're welcome. Awesome. So, uh, Ms. Riddhi, do you want to continue about the bulletin or uh, should we ask the frequently asked questions? Uh, yeah, so the uh, visa bulletin, as I was saying, EB2 moved by three months, EB3 has moved by six months. And as, uh, as per the predictions, um, you know, whatever were the dates for filing in October of last year, they're expecting by this October that those dates will become the final action dates. So, um, very important what I just said. Whatever the dates for filing uh, were in October of last year, they're expecting those dates to become, to move to final action uh, this October. That's what they've been continuously saying. And we've seen, we've been seeing that movement. So um, something to, at least some ideas to what to expect. Um, and we're also hoping that dates for filing also will move, especially for EB3. Uh, so let's see what happens, but uh, that is the update for the, and as I said, again, we're not expecting retrogression of um, final action date. The dates for filing will retrogress in the sense that they will not allow you to use the dates for filing. I think um, October they will, but after that, we're not sure how, for how many months they'll keep it open. Um, usually they keep it open until March, but like, like last year they only had it open for October and November, so only two months. They kept it open, and after that, December again, they started using final action dates. So it's difficult to predict um, how many days they will allow you to use the dates for filing uh, calendar. Uh, so, but the final action dates we expect will remo will remain current uh, and move forward uh, to a certain extent for the rest of this year and perhaps even the first half of next year. That's what we've been hearing. 
So those are the predictions on the visa bulletin, um, which you know a lot of you are waiting for anxiously. I think that's it. Now we can go to the H1 questions. I think um, Swarna, you were asking that uh, uh, if someone is on a ninth year extension, that means they've completed their six years. You're allowed six years on your H1. So if someone is on their ninth year extension, is it possible to shift to a different company that is file a transfer? And uh, what is the procedure to do that? That's what I think, right? That's what you were asking? Yeah, yeah that's true. So, right, so um, yeah, I mean, you can file a transfer or an extension uh, if you are uh, over, if you're over six years provided um, three things happen. One of three things happen. One is that you have an I-140 approved. The approval of the I-140 allows you automatically um, an extension of three year increments perpetually. Uh, there's no end to it. So you can continuously be on a H-1 until you get the green card. Uh, also, um, same thing with the I-140 um, example. Even if the I-140 is not approved, if your labor has been filed, or the labor and I-140 has been filed or pending for the last 365 days, then you can get an extension of one year. You can keep getting extensions of one year as long as uh, your labor or I-140 has been pending for 365 days. So that's only a one year extension though. So that's one way of getting uh, an extension beyond six years or filing a transfer. Um, and another way is if you are outside the country for more than a year, then you can actually come back. This would be consular processing. It could be a new employer or the same employer. You could come back using uh, a fresh six years on your H-1. So um, the stay outside for one year could tr trigger a fresh six years period on your H-1. Uh, also, you could use uh, time um, that you have spent outside the country in the last six years. So you must have gone on vacation or maybe you went on extended vacation in the last six years. So all that time, uh, it could be six months, it could be one year, whatever that time is. You can recapture that time and file an extension just for that recapture time. So that's another way of getting an extension beyond six years. Now, specifically, specifically with reference to uh, a transfer, that means a shift to a different company, um, there's no reason why you can't do that. Uh, even if your I-140 is approved by company A, you can use that I-140 uh, to file uh, an extension beyond six years. So in this example, the person is on the ninth year and wants to file a transfer to another company uh, and he has an I-140 approved from company A but is shifting to company B. Uh, so they can file that transfer to company B um, even if the I-140 is withdrawn by the employer, as long as the I-140 was not revoked by USCIS for some kind of a fraud. So that is the only exception where you cannot use a withdrawn I-140. Uh, in any other instance, even if it's withdrawn or if it's active, even if it's with a different company, you can use it for the purposes of filing extensions beyond six years. Okay. Uh, Miss Reddy, if a person is like after six years of H-1B period, if they are not eligible to extend the extend, I mean get the extension, what are their uh, options? Like, uh, can they switch to F1 or some other status? Yes, they can do that. In many instances, people don't take care of their status, or maybe their plans change. They had no intention of staying here, and they were intending to return after six years, but then their plans changed, and they want to stay back, but whatever the reason is, uh, well, one, obviously one thing is to that, to plan properly so that you start your green card process in uh, the first term of your H1 or as soon as possible and not delay on that because, you know, USCIS is unpredictable and the, the processing times are sometimes, uh, it's beyond our control. So the earlier you start, if you plan to stay here beyond six years, the earlier start, you start your green card process, the better for you and you have more stability that way and also your priority date is retained so you're in the window so there's no reason not to start you know as soon as you can so with but if you don't um, such as in this example this person didn't start and 
uh, is finding themselves in a predicament because the uh, their six years have expired and now they don't know what to do. Um, in such a situation, what you can do is um, I, perhaps you could switch to an F1 or, or switch a change of status to a H4 or to some other status and then file your labor and um, uh, then after the approval of the labor, file the I-140. Once the I-140 is approved, then you can switch back to H1 status, file a change of status again back to H1. That's possible. Or you can leave the country for that period of time that it takes for you know the labor and I-140 to get approved. And once the I-140 is approved, you can come back on a H1 and you're CAP exempt uh, because you're using the I-140 to come in. Uh, you're not using, you're not asking for a fresh six years uh, based on one year stay outside the country. In that situation, you're not CAP exempt. But in this situation where you're not asking for a fresh six years, but you're asking for uh, continuance on your H1 based on the I-140 approval, you can come back. It's CAP exempt. The, the only situation that can arise is um, you know, your tra your when you file for an F1, after you file, um, so just to backtrack, both a B2 and an F1 could be, be problematic depending on the timing of when you file, because the you have to show you have to establish that there's no intent to immigrate when you file a B2 or an F1 application, and by filing an I-140 application. Uh, that's a clear intent to immigrate. But of course, the I-140 is not yet approved, so maybe that intent is not yet established and it's still possible to file. Filing a labor is not an intent to immigrate. That is very clear. So perhaps at the time of filing the labor, you should switch then to an F-1 or a B-2. But remember, you cannot travel on an F-1 or B-2 once the I-140 is filed and you cannot file for an extension of your F1, or extension of B2, or change of school on the F1, or anything to do with USCIS if you're on an F1, like applying for OPT. Anything becomes a problem because now you are, you have the intent to immigrate. So there is a question in the I-539, whether you filed an I-140 and if you answer yes, then you know that case gets denied. So uh, timing is everything as to when you file the change of status. So take a consultation from your attorney and uh, uh, talk to them as to when that switch should happen. But it's possible to, to change status and then, you know, take care of your green card processing and then change, switch back. So viewers, if you have any questions and would like to reach out to Ms. Reddy directly, you can reach out to her to at 212-354-1010, extension is 107 or you can email her at prashanti at reddysq.com. So, Ms. Reddy, is it possible for an H-1B visa holder to start a firm in the US along with a citizen and then transfer their H-1 to their company, to that company? Right, so the lot of, we have a lot of entrepreneurial uh, spirit among the Indian community. So a lot of people um, want to start their own business while they're still on a H-1. And some people do. Uh, but uh, it's not possible to file, um, number one, a H-1 from your own company. You cannot be the employer and employee uh, at the same time. So USCIS would never approve such a petition if they know that you are an employer or you own a share in that, you know, in that company and that you have control over the company. So that uh, may not be possible. But it is possible to own a company while on H-1 in the sense that um, you can own shares in the company. You can be a passive investor. You cannot actually do work because then that becomes work which and it becomes unauthorized work. Uh, on a H-1, you're only supposed to work for the employer that filed your H-1, that where you have the approval. So um, unauthorized work is not allowed and that's what would happen if you worked for the company. But there's no reason why you can't be a shareholder in the company, uh, but you'd have to be a passive share, a shareholder, and then you'd have to have maybe, um, you know, another partner who is, who has a more flexible uh, immigration employment status, who either a H4EAD or 
green card holder or some other kind of EAD person uh, where his immigration status is not um, based on that particular employer and he, you know his employment they allow more open employment so, so you can have a partnership with such a person and then you know possibly um, get the benefits of that business by uh, deriving uh, profits uh, you know why why are your shares that's that's definitely a possibility but be careful but how it looks if your um, uh, profits that you're getting are so high that it's more than your salary they're going to question wh where this additional income came from and then they're going to question uh, what your contribution is to the company for example for an IT consulting company it's not like you're investing any money in it so therefore why did someone give you a share and why are they continuing to give you a share when you're not doing anything there? So, you know, because of the nature of the consulting business, that might be questionable as to why you have a share in the company and what investment you put in and whether that's just a front and you're actually working for the company. So that's it's a possibility that people, someone can look into that. So be cautious, but yes, there is there are ways to do it. Okay. So, uh, Ms. Reddy, can someone apply for two H-1B transfers at a time? Right. This is another question that I get a lot. And it's not just about two H-1B transfers, but there are like two cases at the same time. Uh, we want to file a H-4 to H-1 and a H-1 extension at the same time, just as backup so that, you know, if the H-1 extension uh, gets denied, we'll at least have H-4 status because our I-94 is expiring, which is a valid valid issue and a valid um, reason to do um, file multiple petitions. Uh, so the question really, if I take it in a broader sense is, uh, can I file multiple petitions at a time? And yes, you can, but uh, you have to remember there's something called the last action rule, which pretty much says that whatever is the last action that you took, that means whatever is the last case that you filed, that case will be binding. So if you filed H1 with company A and then you filed uh, H1 with company B, um, then the company B H1 will be binding if it gets approved. But if you withdraw company B H1, then they, before it gets approved, then you're okay uh, and you can still go with company A even after filing two petitions, as long as you withdraw the second one in a timely manner. Um, same thing with um, two parallel applications. You're filing a H1 and a H4. Uh, you file the H1 first, then you file the H4. H1 was premium processing, therefore it got approved. And that was the status that you wanted to be in. Now you have a H4 petition pending. If it gets approved, then your, situ then your status switches to H4 automatically. And you may not want to be in that status. You just filed it as a backup. In that situation, therefore, you should make sure that once your H1 gets approved, you um, withdraw that H4 uh, change of status application and ensure that it has been withdrawn by sending out a letter, uh, a written letter of withdrawal, as well as calling uh, the customer service to make sure that it's withdrawn. That way, you can go with your first case, uh, if that makes sense. So again, in this also timing and strategy is important. Okay. So viewers, if you have any questions and would like to reach out Prashanti Garu directly, you can reach her at 212-354-1010, extension is 107, or you can email her at prashanti at reddysq.com. So Ms. Reddy, uh, if a person is on L1 or H1 visa, so can they start some business of their own? Like should they have like GC2? start a business here? Um, as I was saying, you don't need a GC to start a business. However, you may violate your immigration status by you not, not working on that L1 or H1 for that company as your status doesn't permit you to work with any other uh, employer without you know, actually um, first obtaining a H or L with that company. So if you're on an EAD, you could you know maintain your GC processing uh, by uh, working for the employer and in addition having your own business that's possible but on a h1 there's limitations on l1 there's limitations you have to work for the company that's 
filed and got your petition approved. Um, so this is kind of similar to the previous question. Uh, but again, if you're in some other status, you, like a pending 485, that will give you more flexibility. Uh, but on a H1 or L1, you have very little flexibility. Okay. So uh, if someone transferred their H1B visa to another company and worked with that for a few months, but not happy with them, can they go back to their previous employer who has not canceled their H1B? Yes, again, this is um, a lot of people. So we have tried to compile this these list of questions based on what a lot of clients, you know, always ask. These are the you know typical questions um, that clients always ask, and you know, may not be possible to get a straight answer even if you Google it uh, or by some other means. So, um, so this question is important. Um, uh, because people, it happens often that, you know, people leave and uh, the H1 gets approved for a transfer. So the case, strictly by rule, the case gets approved. So you have requested for a transfer, the transfer is approved to so your status automatically changes as of the date uh, of the approval. Uh, but uh, everything is not written in stone. There's some gray areas and this is one of them. And USCIS in the past has said it all is based on USCIS's interpretation of the regulation, right? Because the regulation is not written in so much detail. So uh, USCIS has confirmed in the past that if it's the H1 has not been withdrawn, then yes, you can go back um, to the previous employer, uh, despite that last action rule that we talked about. Um, for the previous question, there are some exceptions, and this is one of them. If the um, if your status was not cancelled, then it is possible to go back to the previous employer. But I would use this with caution. Okay. So viewers, if you have any more questions and would like to reach out Prashanti directly, you can reach her at 212-354-1010, extension is 107, or you can send an email to her at prashanti at readyes2.com. So, uh, Ms. Reddy, if someone is trying to or like planning to transfer their H-1B visa to J-1 visa, will they get six year more years of H-1B after expiration of J-1 visa? Right. So that rule only applies. So the rule that I think the person is thinking about is the one year rule. So if the person stays out of the country for one year, then they get a fresh six years on their H-1. But that doesn't apply to people who change status. You have to actually leave the country and then come back on a new H-1 uh, in order to get that fresh six years period. And also we have to remember then you're, that you're no longer cap exempt and you'll have to be, you'll be subject to the cap so you'll only be able to come back and get that new six, the new lifeline of six years if you get selected in the cap. So also, if you're on a J-1, there might be other things involved. Uh, you know, a J-1 has some restrictions. They have country, um, uh, you, ha you might have to return to your home country for two years on a J-1, depending on uh, what type of J-1 you get. So the change of status may anyway not be possible, uh, again, depending on the J-1. So, you know, some, that's something to think about as well. Awesome. Uh, uh, Ms. Prishanti, uh, we have a caller, Prakash from uh, Nebraska. Hello, can you hear me? Hello. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Question, yes, we can uh, hear you, yeah. Prakash. Yeah, yeah. Th thank you for taking my call. Uh, I have one quick question, uh, 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 Mrs. Uh, Prashanti Reddy. Like, I, um, I have uh, I-140 approved, but I changed my employer. But my uh, like last year October, I filed my 485 as a dependent through my wife, and we got EAD and AP uh, in the month of May. And uh, my priority date is like you know 10 months ahead of uh, my uh, spouse. Uh, so let's say if I move to EAD, if I start using EAD, uh, I don't know what's the process to use use EAD, like filing a 99 form or uh, whatever it is. Okay. Would, it, would I be able to come back to H1 if required without going back to home country, uh, if at all, if my company wants to start a form for a process once again, so that in case it takes retrogress, 
and if i would like to file another 485 on my name uh, you know uh, just to make sure uh, both both our patriots are in 2014 um, so they are not current in final action date right now um, but mine is like 10 months ahead of my wife but you didn't file anyway so your question is basically no matter what the facts are which we won't get into right now um if you move to um ead can you move back to a h1 right that's the crux that's of your question that's correct that's correct so um yeah so if you move to um ead in order to get back onto a h1 you have to actually leave the country and come back on a h1 uh visa and get the h1 i94 and come back on a h1 in order to start on a h1 you can't again okay. you can't there's no such thing as filing a change of status from ead back to h1 you have to leave the country and come back on a h1 so that that might involve getting a visa a h1 visa if, because most probably by then you know you don't know whether your mm-hmm. visa will be there or not if you don't if you have a visa then you can just use that uh visa to come in uh, using the mm-hmm. uh, 797 and come in on a h1 and you should be okay but but uh, i already have an approved h1b petition so if i come back on ap uh, so should i mandatorily go to consulate is the question so in that case if, if i need to take a new visa you need a visa to you need to show your h1 yeah so you can't come back on a advance parole you need to actually come back on your uh, h1 in order to change status to a h1 from ead Oh. If you come back on advance okay. parole you are coming back on AP. Okay. That doesn't help okay. your uh, because and previously you were not on H1 you are on EAD. Okay, got it. Got it. And uh, again like it, yeah so so do you um, in the next uh, any time soon uh uh, 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 uh Mr. Prashant Reddy like you know do you see 2014 uh, December uh, final action date to be current any time soon do you anticipate that or uh, like my only fear is if it retrogresses what what is the um, alternate thing that i have to do so that's why i'm thinking about the alternatives in case if i use no the, so are you eb what your eb3 right eb2 yeah eb2 it was also eb2 EB and it was downgraded to eb3 and uh, uh, yeah i140 is also and what is your date again 20 what is it 20 what 2014 uh, November end. So you are already. Uh, it's already 2014 January, EB3. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, it moved six months. So the likelihood of it, but I don't understand. If you are EB2, then uh, your your priority date is already current, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, no, that, that's right. But I changed my employer. I didn't file uh, last year, but I filed it through my spouse. Oh, uh, I'm talking okay, about my, okay. My priority date is 2014 January. My wife's priority date is 2014 November. So just trying to see if uh, things go wrong, then I. Well, I, if yours is 2014 January, it's it's current. No, uh, 2014 January first is current, right? So mine is January 15th. Yeah. So. It's, Not, not yeah, it's, it'll, it'll for sure get current. Yeah, it'll get. Uh, it's much better than November, right? So it'll get current most probably next month. No, but uh, my sure. firm it's not started after after I join new employer. My firm hasn't started it. Firm and um, none of the process has been started. Oh, I see. Of, okay, okay, okay. I missed all that part. Yeah, I wasn't focusing on that when you told me. Yeah, okay. So yeah, if the firm hasn't been filed, then you should immediately file. I don't know what you're waiting for. file your labor okay. and uh, get your i140 approved with the earliest priority date that you have okay and then you need to decide whether you want you need to file in eb3 or eb2 i mean you have to obviously file yeah. in eb2 because then it's current already yeah eb3 is current uh, not eb2 right uh, eb3 uh, sorry is current to 2014 eb2 is 2011 right Yeah. So then you need that, to file in uh, EB3. Yeah, there's no reason mm. not to file as soon as possible and not depend okay. on your wife's case. But but I like I think right there were some saying people few people were telling telling that they should have multiple I-485 petitions, yes yes, and get confused and 
things may be delayed so Nothing much. get confused. I mean, uh, they they will withdraw one and they will keep the other. In October okay. itself, people filed multiple 485s because, you know, people were worried that one case will get denied. So they filed another case and they have just automatically okay. approved the first case and then uh, they themselves closed the second case. So we don't have to worry about okay. USCIS confusion. We have to do what is good for us. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, and are you seeing any uh, downgrade approvals? Uh, uh, attorney, like, you know, did you, from your form? Uh, it's, taking it's taking a while. Approval? Yeah. Downgrade. Yes. Downgrade approvals are taking a while because premium processing is becoming a problem. Some cases premium mm -hmm. processing they are approving. Others uh, they are not. So premium I-140 downgrade itself is taking 10 months now. So or more. So, um, yeah, we're not, we're, approvals are coming for ones which were not downgrades, but for the downgrade cases, those are still pending. Awesome. Okay. So, uh, Ms. Reddy, can we go back to our questions? I think um, you're done with the caller. Yes. Okay. Um, so, Ms. Reddy, when someone is on L1 visa and their H1 visa, got approved, H-1B visa got approved. Does the US ICS cancel their L-1 status once the H-1B is approved? Uh, so uh, there is no such thing as them canceling it. But as I was saying earlier, when we talked about filing multiple petitions at the same time, once you uh, request a certain status and the status is granted, then it's granted as of the date of the approval. And if you don't want it to be granted, then you should withdraw it before it gets approved. So yes, I mean, they don't, it, while the L1 is not uh, withdrawn or revoked automatically, your status does change from L to H upon approval of the H petition. So you can no longer work on the L petition once you get the H1 approved. And there is no exception for this, right? In the previous case, we talked about filing a H-1 transfer and going back to the H-1 from the previous employer. In that situation, they're allowing it because it's the same status. You haven't changed status. It's, you're still in the H status. You've just changed employers. But in this situation, you're actually changing status. So you can't go from one status to another without actually filing for a change of status again. So if you want to, want to get back to an L status, then you'll have to file for uh, a change of status once again. So yes, if you have any questions and would like to reach out Prashanti directly, you can call her at 212-354-1010, extension is 107, or you can email her at prashanti at readysq.com. Okay, uh, Miss Reddy, we have a caller, uh, Mr. Ganesh from Seattle. Hello. Oh, Murali. Hi, Mr. Murali. Please go ahead with your question. Hi. Yeah, hi, Prashant. This is uh, Murali from Seattle. So when submitting uh, the 485, right, I think our lawyers had not asked us not to submit the medicals along with that. And then, uh, mm -hmm. so now the date is not current yet, but do you suggest us submitting the medicals beforehand without uh, getting an RFE? Because we heard that people are getting uh, GC without the interview nowadays. Oh, yeah, absolutely. People are getting, uh, cases are not being interviewed unless there is a need for interviewing, even in cases where there's arrest warrants and stuff, as long as the um, they're asking for documentary evidence uh, pertaining to the ar arrest. And as long as uh, that's fine and that, that matter has been taken care of, um, they're not really um, having... Um, in-person interviews, they're trying to avoid that. So yeah, you're right, you're right about, um, you know, that there are not, not many interviews. Um, so with reference to medicals, it's unfortunate, I've, you know, that medicals were not filed. We tried to file medicals as much as possible. Uh, some of our clients wouldn't listen to us, but we, uh, we you know, got, we filed uh, applications with, complete applications with medicals as well. And that has really helped our clients because they have, uh, especially if the date becomes current, it really helps uh, because, you know, otherwise an RFE 
has, is really uh, putting a stop to that processing because you have to wait for the RFE, submit the medical, then again USCIS has to process it and then only will they request for a visa number. And so that's adding to the processing time and the anxiety of people also because then the um, um, the dates, they worry that the dates might retrogress. But if you're asking me whether you can interfile uh, a medical when yeah, there's no RFE, that is at your yeah, risk. Can we submit? Can we submit the medicals before that's, that's a risk. Before getting an RFE? Yeah, that's a risk because you, you can submit. Nobody's stopping you from doing anything. But that's a risk because the medicals may not find their way to the actual file. Because you're asking, it's unsolicited mail. You're, they're not asking you for something and you're submitting it. And usually when that happens, they throw it in the garbage usually. But uh, uh, if, you know, they actually pull out your file because your file might be somewhere else and not ready for processing. So they might not be ready to even pull out your file and put it in the file, right? They need to, it needs to get into your file. So what I'm saying is you can do it, but don't, don't expect 100% it will get to your file. If you get an RFE again asking for the same medicals, don't be surprised. I know a lot of people okay. are interfiling. Okay. At okay. least if you so get an RFE for thing? something else and at least if you get an RFE for something else and not for the medical, it makes sense to send the medical as well because everything will go into the package, you know, into your file. Sure. But if you're not getting an RFE at all and you're filing, it is a risk, but there's no harm in doing it except for having to do it again. Sounds good. Yeah, thanks a lot. You're welcome. All right, uh, that's great, Ms. Reddy. Uh, let's get back to our questions. So when someone gets a new job recently, their employer has filed a H-1B transfer petition. When can they start legally working? So that's the good thing about uh, H-1 transfers. You don't have to wait for the actual uh, approval. You can start working as soon as USCIS receives the petition. So it's not upon getting a receipt because that happens later. You usually get a receipt a, a week or 10 days later. So you don't have to wait for the actual receipt, but you can track the package, uh, send it by FedEx or UPS or whatever, courier service. So you can track it and once the package has been delivered and it's confirmed by the courier facility that it's been delivered, the person can safely start working, uh, you know, on, um, on that transfer. But the uh, downside to that is uh, once they start working and then, you know, if the previous employer withdraws the H1, which they're supposed to do, uh, because the employer, employee is no longer working for them. And then you, unfortunately, your H1 um, gets denied. Then you will be left without status because you cannot go back to your previous employer because the petition has been withdrawn. And you cannot stay in the country with because your uh, new petition has been denied. So you have to leave the country. So that's the oh. risk when you file based on a transfer. Okay. Uh, Ms. Reddy, we have uh, Mr. Ashok from New Jersey. We have a caller. Hello. Hi, Mr. Ashok. Yeah, hello. Hi. Hey, hi. Uh, Ashok, uh, this is Ashok here. Uh, Namaste, Prashanti Reddy. Hi, Ashok. Uh, yeah, Namaste, hi, Andy. Uh, okay. Namaste, Andy. Uh, can I talk to you in Telugu? That's fine. Yeah. Argandi, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, I don't know, Andy. I'm going to go to my house. I'm going to go so, then we will extend the extent of the almost six months complete. So, any days we will do it, plus at the same time, extension is not done. So, next time when she is coming back to visit us, so, we will be able to get out of the port of entry. So, now we will be able to get maximum one year. So, we are already... Tanaku six months stay unte you can extend by filing an I-539 petition for another six months maximum. So Atlanta put a mountain and day miru the processing time for a B2 extension itself is 10 months. So our six months will most probably that six months will get over and she'll have to leave before getting an approval, right? So whatever the date you put on the I-539 application, Tan Kante Mundu, she has to leave. 
so as long as she leaves before that time then keep keep with you the receipt and the okay. approval if you get an approval or whatever correspondence you get from USCIS and next time okay. tanu travel jaisna appudu make sure that she carries that correspondence with that her letter approval in case letter. USCIS okay. approval or receipt or whatever you get okay okay so that uh, yeah next time when she travels oka vela vallu akada cbp lo emana adugute then you can submit uh, um you can show proof if they ask again don't give information when they don't uh, ask but if they ask then okay. you know you can show them that information that yeah. you did not overstay you filed an extension uh, on a timely basis okay okay yeah one second and my wife she just wanted to talk to you her name is vijay lakshmi Hi ma'am. Okay. Uh, sorry to interrupt you. I have a quick hi. question actually. Uh, hi ma'am. Good evening. Uh, like uh, my mother actually she supposed to leave by next month September 21st ma'am. So I have spoken to people they said like uh, we have to apply 45 days before. But at this moment like around like uh, 30 33 days is it is that fine ma'am? Me actually weekly submission chey both na maan le. Yeah, atla em ledu. Are me adhe me rinna di adhe incorrect. Atla atla em ledu. So you can file yeah. even one day before the expiry of her I-94, okay. as long as the package is is received by USCIS before the expiry date, aren't they? Or on okay. the expiry Online date. But of course, you don't want to wait. Okay. Yeah. 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 Online and file just goes. Yeah. Yes, goes. Kadandi. And as long as like uh, before yes, and out coach. of charge, chelle mon chase kunde sare potni is not mandatory part for this kunde. No, there is no such okay. 45 day rule. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, ma'am. Anyway, my mom she will be stay another three more months, ma'am, and she will not go to the Himalayan that also. Thank you so much, ma'am. You're welcome. Awesome. That's great. So, uh, Miss Reddy, let's go back to our question. So, could you please suggest, like, or advise us to how to serve it as for an employer not to pay on bench for more than thirty days? Uh. Okay, so you're basically asking me how severe is it if an employer yes. does not pay on bench for more than thirty days, which means that what happens if basically to ask the question in a different way, what happens if an employer doesn't pay an employee on a H one uh, for thirty days or more? So the answer to that is the employer has to pay the employee every single day of employment, even if it's one day or thirty days. There is no thirty day rule. so if they don't pay the employer will pay face penalties and the employee will be out of status now of course there are exceptions to everything so the exception is that if the uh, employee took leave for example they took leave for some medical reasons or some other family emergency and they have taken leave without pay because they have already maybe you have uh um certain system in your office whereby you have certain number of paid vacation days and they have taken beyond those days so you don't have to fire them they can still take unpaid vacation and they are still in status right so as long as that is a situation it's not that you're laying them off and they are in between projects and uh because they are right now uh not in a productive state you have not you are not paying them as long as that is not the situation and the reason for not paying is at the request of the employee because they are taking personal leave that that is fine okay. but you cannot bench them the question is can i bench my employee for 30 days you cannot bench them for one day also okay that's good so viewers if you have any questions and would like to reach out miss freddy directly You can call her at two one two three five four one zero one zero. Extension is one zero seven, or you can email her at prashanti at readysq dot com. So, Miss Reddy, can an H one B visa for a brand new company with zero dollars revenue be approved? How much does the revenue of the company affect the GC processing? Right. So, there's two different questions. You're asking me two different questions in one question. So, the first question is. Um, can a lot of um, prospective employers call me and ask look i'm just starting my business uh can i file a h1 or do i need to be in business for one year to file a h1 so they get confused with the l1 requirements and the h1 requirements or someone tells them something and you know a lot of misinformation spreads 
So you can start filing H1s from the day one that your company is incorporated as long as you have uh, a fully functioning business. So uh, you have an office space and I'm not talking about uh, giving yourself a lease and leasing out one of your bedrooms in your in your house. No, I'm talking about having a commercial office space. So as long as you have a commercial office space with a commercial lease, um, and I'm not talking about a virtual office either. Um, USCIS actually is old fashioned that way and they want to look at brick and mortar offices because they're posting requirements, etc. So, you know, physical office is required. Um, so as long as you have a physical office, you have a bank account and you're able to operate normally, you have all the licenses that you require to operate, yes, you can go ahead and file a H-1. Now, anyone small or big can file a H-1. The requirement for a H-1 is that the company show that they have um, a requirement for the employee. They have to show that the employment is not speculative. As of the date of filing, they need that employee and why they need that employee. So in an IT consulting situation, they have to show that they have an actual project for that employee. So they have to show, you know, the client letter, the PO, the contract to show that the employment is not speculative. So yes, you can start you can start um, filing on day one. With, with reference to the GC processing, that's a little different. In the GC processing, you have to show that. Uh, especially in the I-140 stage, which is the second stage, you have to show that you have the ability to pay your employee the prevailing wage. So if you're a small company and you don't have revenues uh, or profits, you're not showing profits, and if the employee is not being paid the prevailing wage already, because remember the GC prevailing wage could be different from your H-1 prevailing wage. So then what will happen is your I-140 will not get approved. So it's important either to pay the GC prevailing wage already if, you don't, if you're not showing much profit in your tax return or to show more profit in the tax return or to show net current assets uh, as a way to show that you have the ability to pay. So that's with reference to the uh, how your revenue can affect GC processing. Okay, so good to know this uh, opportunity. So uh, Ms. Prashanti, thank you so much for clarifying all the questions. So viewers, before we wind up, if you have any questions and would like to reach out Prashanti directly, you can call her at 212-354-1010, extension is 107, or you can uh, um, email her at prashanti at readysq.com. So thank you, Ms. Prashanti, once again for answering and uh, clarifying all the questions. This is Varna signing off. You're watching Teleku Prajala Manasakhi, Sakshi TV. Namaste. Namaste. Thank you.